Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to session three of today's work, of uh, the Tuesday work day of the workshop. Uh, we have two student talks this afternoon, and I will introduce the first one now. Uh, our speaker is Edgardo Villa Sepulveda, and Sepulveda. We talked about this. I'll get it right. And uh, he's going to be talking to us a bit about homoclinic snaking. Thanks very much, Edgardo. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to, for me to be here. I mean, the first question I sort of started wondering about, like, when I received the invitation from Phil, it was like, should I actually go there? Because it was like, just one month ago, I had no idea about beyond logger asymptotic stuff. I mean, I had a big project that I wanted to tackle, but it was like, I had no idea about like how to try to tackle it, how to understand the idea, how to do anything. And it was like, okay, but every now and then, you know that when you work under pressure, it's sort of like all the ideas sort of like come together in some sense. And that's what I tried to do. And it was like, uh, well, up to now, everything has worked quite nicely, I think. And uh, well, hopefully that my talk will be interesting for uh, most of you and uh, like, the particular uh, interesting thing of this talk, I think, is that, well, mo many, many people here are interested sort of like in the general case. You have talked about like, can that be sort of generalized or can that be sort of applied to many other different problems? And that's, that's what I'm trying to do with this, uh, this kind of approach you will see uh, in my talk. Okay, so, uh, well, this talk should be like, I should be here together with Alan Chamnitz, who is my supervisor. Okay, but unfortunately he didn't feel so well uh, yesterday. So, well, I just, I, I just have his name over there. And so, well, he should be like giving the first 25 minutes of the talk and then I should like uh, end the talk. So probably this talk could be like shorter or maybe I can just like, well, we could just probably for all the talks, we could just talk for like ages or something like that. I will just try to focus on the most important details just to sort of like uh, not make it like quite boring, okay? So let's go. This is an overview of the talk, okay? I'm gonna talk about homoclinic snaking from the generate Turing bifurcations, okay? So that's what I'm dealing with. I'm, I'm focusing my attention on Turing bifurcations, okay? So I will start by sort of like introducing all the ideas about Turing bifurcation normal forms because that sort of motivates that, well, that's the sort of like part of the motivation for the problem itself I'm gonna uh, talk to you about, okay? Then I'm gonna focus on a particular kind of model, the Schnakenberg type models. I have like a big expression with many different parameters that as you go setting different parameters, you, get the, you go getting different uh, models, like the Brasilator, the Schnakenberg model, glycolysis model, and so on. Like there are five models, I think. So then of course I will just focus on one of those, which is the Brasilator. And then, like uh, with all the sort of like uh, some nice results I got about the, brus the brusillator, that sort of motivates the idea of the beyond or order asymptotic stuff. Okay, so well then I will give a brief idea about the like other projects I have been working in uh, with and some references uh, about the like all the uh, where where I have gotten all the information about this. Okay, so well. Let's first pose a general, I mean, I, I like to also always like try to work with uh, general systems. I don't try to sort of like, I, I don't prescribe a reaction term in particular. So in, the, in a general sense, I mean, if, if you think of you as a vector here, if you is a vector, that's a general reaction diffusion equation, what you have over there. And just like for simplicity, we're just assuming um, Neumann boundary conditions, but that of course, like it's a, uh, like you, you have kind of a degree of freedom. You can like choose maybe between uh, Neumann and periodic boundary conditions. And there are other maybe uh, different boundary conditions uh, under which the solutions are bounded, which is the, the most interesting part of this. Okay, and we are going to assume that the diffusion matrix, which is the that my matrix D over there, is a diagonal matrix with uh, non-negative entries. Yeah, X is just a scalar. Yeah, if this is just a, a general reaction diffusion equation with n components, I mean n variables, but only in one spatial dimension. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, well, just like uh, as in the general approach, just as in the like the, in the general theory, we are going to assume that P is going to be a stable homogeneous steady state. That means that F of P is equal to zero. Okay. 
And then, well, we'll, we'll assume that P goes through a Turing bifurcation at a certain parameter over uh, that is called eta over there with a wave number, with a precise wave number, which can be sort of like seen in the dispersion relation we have over there. In this case, in particular, that value of k is like the, the wave number we are focusing our attention on. Okay, so let's go. Uh, okay, so, well, um, probably you have all seen uh, that this kind of stuff with uh, that has to do with the weekly nonlinear analysis. Using the weekly nonlinear analysis, you can get like quite general expressions about the criticality of the Turing bifurcation. Because if you think of this like, uh, if you start sort of projecting the bifurcation onto a, onto a suitable uh, manifold, you can see that this bifurcation is actually a pitchfork bifurcation. Okay, so you just start by that, that ansatz with an amplitude over there, uh, with uh, this vector phi defined with this equation over here. And then you get with, Nick, with weekly nonlinear analysis, you can prove that this is the equation that um, defines the variable A, which is the amplitude of the equation. And as you can see, well, this is just a, like the normal form of a pitchfork bifurcation. What's the good thing of this is that, of course, C3 here determines the criticality of the bifurcation. If C3 is negative, then we have a regular supercritical Turing bifurcation. Okay, that means that the pattern that appears after the bifurcation is a stable. Okay. Whilst um, wh when C3 is greater than zero, then we have a subcritical Turing bifurcation, and that that like usually implies the existence of localized patterns, and that's like an interesting part of the like um, for the purpose of this talk. That's uh, that's the most interesting part of this. Okay, and C5. Well, you have like, well, that's the normal form of the pitchfork bifurcation, just up to that part over there. But C5 is important only when C3 is approximately equal to zero, okay? And when C5 is less than zero, then we have like, um, usually under generic conditions, a homoclinic snaking for the um, sort of the, the part of the, around the part of the bifurcation curve in which C3 is negative, okay? So what I mean here is that, let me explain this in a better way. Okay, this is a Turing bifurcation curve. Okay, so you have here a co-dimension two bifurcation point, C3 is equal to zero. And let us assume that C5 is less than zero. Okay, then that means, of course, is if C3 is equal to zero here, that means that, well, we, we will have two different signs. Let's say here that C3 is negative, here that C3 is positive, okay? So that means that the bifurcation is subcritical on this part of the, the curve. So that means that the homoclinic snaking will appear over there, like um, around this side of the bifurcation curve, okay? So, uh, well, as, I, as it says, like uh, we shall analyze the co-dimension two bifurcation point at, at which the, um, this coefficient, the third order coefficient is equal to zero. Okay, that's the interesting part of the of this. Okay, so well, let's start by um, sort of like setting the problem in a kind of general way with a particular model. Okay, so let us consider a system, a general system that is like uh, as I told you, sort of like you have many different parameters, and as you go setting different parameters over there. Uh, you start getting different models that are pretty well known. Like the Schnakenberg model is sort of like a toy model that is pretty uh, used in the in the literature, as, uh, as well as the Brasilator and the glycolysis model and so on. So the good thing of, well, one nice property of this system is that um, it doesn't matter like which parameters you, you set here, you will only have one equilibrium point. That's, an, uh, that's a homogeneous steady state in this context, okay? So well, um, one o another nice thing of this system is that all the sort of like um, most of the things can be done in an algebraic, um, algebraic symbolic way. That's the thing, it's sort of like you can get all the expressions, the explicit expressions of the bifurcation curves, all the like the third order coefficient, the fifth order coefficient and so on. You can get everything uh, quite explicitly, okay? And in fact, this is the, the expression that determines the Turing bifurcation curve. Okay, and another thing is that all these models found to have similar bifurcation diagrams. I mean, you can see something like this for many different um, models 
even like, uh, of course, the, um, on their particular parameters. But this is essentially sort of the form that you can find uh, for those models. And you have like different regions, a Turing region, a snaking region, which is the important part here. And uh, well, you have a, a BD line as well. And you have co-dimension two bifurcation points, for instance, over there or like on many different parts depending on the system, OK? So let us focus now our attention in the bracelator, as I told you at the, at the beginning, OK? So in the bracelator, setting, of course, some of the parameters equal to 0, as you can see here in the bracelator, B and D are equal to 0, and H is equal to C minus 1. Well, then we can make this scaling. A, which is a parameter of the system, will be equal to this kind, this thing over here. With that change, the system becomes this, which is a quite nice system, OK? And then, well, uh, as, I, as I was telling you, the generate Turing bifurcations can be found analytically, OK? Everything can be done analytically for this system, OK? In particular, the Turing bifurcation curve in the uh, Xi C plane is independent of delta, because delta is a parameter here of the system. But the bifurcation curve doesn't depend on delta. And there are two points that are also uh, delta independent where the third order coefficient is equal to 0 and the fifth order coefficient is negative. That is wonderful because that gives rise to this thing, uh, well, usually at least, to this thing I was talking about, the snaking over here. Okay? So, uh, well, even uh, like <laughs> um, furthermore, the Turing bifurcation curve, as you can see, it's quite simple. This is just a parabola in the like in the um, C psi plane, okay? And we have here the expression of the third order coefficient, which is equal to this kind of thing, where h of psi is equal to this thing over here. And of course, the zeros of that function can be uh, found analytically, and these are the zeros of that function, okay? So, well, those are the graphs of the fifth order coefficient. Like, as I told you, like um, the um, Turing bifurcation curves and the, um, the coordinates of the, third or, uh, like the points that have the third order coefficient being equal to zero are invariant, are delta invariant, but the fifth order coefficient changes with delta, but it's like negative for all the values of delta between zero and one, which is a nice thing, okay? And that's the bifurcation diagram. Okay, so as I told you, we have two different co-dimension two bifurcation points, one over there and the other one over there. And that is for all the values of delta, okay? So one interesting thing here is that, well, uh, uh, well as, uh, as the same thing happen, happens with uh, both points, we can just focus on one of them, okay? So we'll, we'll focus our attention in that bifurcation point, in that co-dimension two bifurcation point. And what we have here is that if, if we zoom in in this region, we can see this, this over here. That, the, the curve on top, is the Turing bifurcation curve. And these two lines that appear over there are exactly these lines I was describing over here. Okay, those lines appear generically when you have a, a change of criticality, uh, a point where C3 is equal to zero, and C5 is negative. Okay, so now the question is, what are those curves? Probably some of you know what are those curves, okay? But those curves are fold, fold curves, okay? Because what happens here is, let me show you in the next picture, probably, yeah. This is what's happening, actually. You have the homoclinic snaking, and of course, like, there is a kind of like, um, like an interval of values of alpha where you have the, the homoclinic snaking, and of course, like, in the, in the extreme points, like here in the, uh, on the right and on the left, if we have like the collisions with the fold bifurcation curve. And of course, as you can see, we have two extreme points, one on the left and one on the right. And of course, this is essentially telling you like that is the interval of values of alpha or gamma or whatever the parameter is in which uh, you can sort of move around to sort of like find the snaking, okay? So, this is interesting, this is lovely, this is like, okay, now, sort of like, oh, how can we sort of like analyze this? How can we sort of like, what can we do with this kind of stuff? I mean, 
if you just sort of like have a look at this graph, it looks nice. Okay, that's everything. But what happens with this? Well, as you can see here, I just draw sort of like a line here in a parti at a particular point. Let's say that this is a value of the parameter, let's say alpha star, okay? But what happens if you start getting closer to this bifurcation point? Let's say that you take a value of alpha star over here, for instance, alpha star. As you can see here, the interval is thinner, okay? And the interval, as you can, as you get like a closer to this bifurcation point, the interval of values of alpha gets thinner and thinner, thinner and thinner, thinner and thinner. What happens in the end, like in the limit? Well, of course, that interval, the length of that interval uh, becomes exponentially small, okay? Which is, of course, like a, a motivation for this part of the, uh, for this seminar, okay? So, let's go and see, well, this is kind of the, the usual approach one usually takes to analyze these kinds of systems in terms of the Turing bifurcations or whatever kind of normal form. One usually uh, shifts the system to the origin. I mean, the equilibrium to the origin. So we, ju we just make that change of variables to shift the, the equilibrium to the origin and say, okay, we want to center our system at zero, zero u and b being equal to zero is the equilibrium point, okay? Then we need to introduce two normal form parameters, okay? Those are given by this thing. This is to do with the Turing bifurcation curve. I don't know if you remember, but c being equal to this thing is the bifurcation curve. That means that when eta is equal to zero, then you are at the Turing bifurcation line, okay? Does that make sense? And we make this change of variables here this like uh, scaling of this parameter just to um, sort of like focus our attention on the like the zero of this parameter will be the co-dimension two bifurcation point. Okay, that's just like the usual um, approach. Okay, and then with this the system becomes something like this which looks quite um, like more terrible than what we had before. Before our system was something like that, which is quite nice. And now the system is something like this, okay? And of course, you need to like start expanding this system as a, like in Taylor series. And as you can see, here we have this parameter in the denominator. That's a quite nice expression that can be written in an easy way uh, as a power series. How? Well, we can just replace that by that term over there. And that's, that's the term over there as well. Okay, so now you see this and it's sort of like, okay, this is dreadful. This is sort of like, this, is, this wasn't the system that I was expecting that, us, that I was sort of like uh, planning to analyze. My system was simple. Uh, everything was like, uh, could be gotten like analytically and everything. What can we do with this system? No idea. That was the sort of like the main task, the main part of the, w what I wanted to, to sort of do. To perform asymptotics, to sort of like say something about the snaking, to sort of like prove that the, the snaking exists for this system, okay? But this is the system, okay? So this is now the motivation. This is just the motivation for everything. Now you can forget literally everything, okay? This is just the motivation for everything, okay? I don't want to deal with this system in particular. Why? Because like, I don't know, start taking derivatives, like, I don't know, one after another, it's sort of like it's a terrible task to do it like manually, or even if you sort of like code something, it's sort of like, okay, that will be useful like for this system, but what happens if you change, I don't know, the, that term over there, instead of e uh, eta is like, I don't know, delta squared. It's sort of like you need to change probably everything because you don't know whether the sort of like the code will be sort of like generalizable in that, in that sense, okay? So let us forget everything and let us pose everything in a general way. As I was telling you, I mean, this is sort of like the, the most interesting part of this, I think, okay? So I'm just gonna pose everything in a general way. This is a general reaction diffusion equation. This is like, I don't know, it can be literally ev ev anything. Like this could be like an exponential function, a polynomial or whatever, literally whatever. Okay, and we are expanding this like as, um, as polynomials from start, okay? 
we are in particular doing something like this. This will be f not not plus we have eta f uh, one not plus psi f zero one plus and so on. We are just expanding this uh, function from the beginning in terms of those two parameters. Why are we doing that? Well, because, like, well, uh, as you probably know, when you're doing the exponential asymptotics, you need to take care about the, the order of the derivative you're taking into account because they wi that will, of course, influence the, the order, the magnitude of the, the, the power, the, the power, uh, the power of epsilon that you are um, that you have in that term. Okay. So we are just doing this sort of like to take care of those terms in a sort of easier way in some sense, up to some point at least, okay? And here we are just going to assume that zero is a steady state undergoing a Turing bifurcation as, as eta increases through zero, okay? So that means, this is just the Turing bifurcation condition, that the determinant of this matrix, okay, for some value of k is equal to zero. Okay, and we are going to assume this for all the values of, of psi here because uh, eta, when eta is going uh, equal to zero, that's a Turing bifurcation for all the values of psi. Okay, that's just a, like uh, a general assumption. Okay, so, well, of course, as I was telling you, sort of like the like there is no, there are no exponential terms, just like um, in the model in the system in particular, but of course, like. If you want to analyze an exponentially asymptotically small thing, of course you need to start like um, sort of creating new variables, sort of like um, trying to implement the um, sort of a, a new formulation to sort of like uh, analyze the, that part of the system, okay? So let us just define as usual uh, a variable epsilon, which is, the, uh, is sufficiently small, okay? And uh, um, a little scale here. Okay, and we are going to consider eta being equal to epsilon to the power of four. Okay, this is just based on a uh, Chapman and Co-Zero paper, which is like, um, I don't know, this is sort of, uh, that's sort of like, all the theory is based on that paper because it's sort of like, you first need to sort of um, know what the scalings are or have a brief idea about that. Why are we taking in particular that parameter? Well, the same motivation, but I have seen other two papers in which they have dealt with the same kind of scaling. So my sort of like, my question here that I'm trying to answer in some sense is to sort of like say, is this actually a general thing? Can this be generalized to uh, any kind of system or whatever? And that is sort of like my, my approach. My, this is my try actually. Okay, so with this, the system becomes something like this, which is quite terrible, but not so much. I think it's, this, is even, this even looks nicer than the, the, than the Brasilator, the last version of the Brasilator, I think, okay? So, of course, what we're gonna do? Well, we're gonna expand the variable and the criticality parameter in this form, okay? Just as usual, you have this uh, to be expanded in terms of epsilon, and this will be also uh, expanded in terms of epsilon. Remember that uh, psi has to do with the criticality of the bifurcation, and well, this is just the, the variable of the system, okay? So, well, as you know, we can go like order by order, okay? Let's go, I mean, I'm not gonna develop all the orders up to order five, I'm just gonna show sort of like the, the main ideas here, okay? So at order epsilon, you get like a nice equation that is solvable in the same way as the previous ansatz I talked about, okay? which is really nice, you have uh, one amplitude here, and you have, of, co of course, the complex conjugate of that term just to make this real, okay? And where, well, that's the definition of the, this vector, which is uh, exactly the, the eigenvector, uh, essentially, of, the, of that matrix, okay? Then, what happens at, at order epsilon uh, to the second power, okay? Then, well, of course, if when you go, like, expanding the equation, you get quite a lot of terms, quite like if get everything gets quite harder, but after you do some algebra and everything, you can see that the solution will have this form over here, okay? And I mean, that's, those are the definitions of, the, of these vectors you have over here. 
What's the problem here? There is a problem because uh, like at each order, there will be some problems. You, of course, know about the solvability conditions you need to fulfill in order to uh, be able to make these expansions, okay? So in this case, the problem arises here in this equation, okay? So what we need is to ensure that this vector over here belongs to the image of that matrix over there. Otherwise, we have here psi one, which can be equal to zero, okay? And this is pretty interesting because like in Chapanako Ref's paper, they don't have to deal with that kind of equation. Why? Because that term is equal to zero. And if that term is equal to zero, then this is not a problem actually. So it's sort of like for that reason I was, I, I was telling you that sort of like, I don't know, every now and then you, you may code something, but you don't know whether that is sort of like that generalizable. There are some terms that appear just like in the general in the general case, in the general situation. So for that reason, we need to take care of all those solvability conditions and, you, and we need to ensure that either this uh, belongs to the image of that matrix or that parameter is equal to zero, okay? How can we do that? Like in a simple way? Well, we define this vector, which is the, um, uh, the vector that defines the kernel of the adjoint of the Jacobian matrix. Okay, and then we need to impose this condition. We are just using um, the Fred Holm alternative. Probably most of you know the, that theorem. Okay, and we need to impose that condition and under that condition, we are ready to go, to keep going with the next order and following or keeping like, um, keep going. Okay, then what happens at order three? Well, at order three, we get this kind of solution, which is quite hellish, I know. But as you can see, the most interesting part here is that, well, you have many uh, terms that, uh, that only have to do with A1, and there are some terms that have to do with the another amplitude, the amplitude that appeared at the second order solution, okay? But as you can see, these terms have uh, some vectors that we already determined, okay? Here they're sort of like exponents, the, the, the exponents in parentheses, um, have to do with the order at which th those vectors appeared for the first time, okay? So we don't have any solvability conditions that come out from these terms. Because for instance, oh, like uh, uh, over there you have phi, that vector is like already determined, you don't need anything else there, okay? You only need to take care about the, of the um, solvability conditions that come from these terms over here, those three terms, okay? And then just focusing on those terms, I mean, I can give the expressions for all the vectors, but that doesn't matter actually. Focusing just on those terms, you get these uh, equations over here. This is the first equation, second equation, and third equation. What happens here? Again, solvability condition, we need, um, yeah, well, we need to sort of like uh, make the inner, uh, use the inner product of this um, vector together with psi and that needs to be equal to zero to ensure that we can solve the system, okay? And that we, for all the equations, okay? Some problems that appear here, or kind of problems, I have no idea whether those are actually problems, okay? What happens, for instance, I told you before that there are some systems in which these terms, this term doesn't appear, for instance, okay? But what happens when you have a solvability condition? When you have a solvability condition, the term doesn't disappear. The solvability condition only ensures that the, the equation can be solved. That's the thing. But the term doesn't disappear. What happens if you, if you have only a one component equation, just as many equations like the Swift-Hohenberg equation or whatever? You start getting something like this. Ut, no, shouldn't be ut. Let's say the linear part of u will be equal to, I don't know, something that depends on like probably A1 plus uh, some other term here that have, has the exponential plus another term here that has the exponential to the power of two and so on, okay? But in the real case, of course, here you have a, just a scalar. This is just a scalar, say for instance, I don't know, three psi one minus one, for instance. Then here you say, okay, psi one needs to be equal to one third, and you can solve the equation. But 
this term just disappears. You just don't need to consider it. Okay? But in the general case, like in the in the vector in the vectorial case, you of course like this this all these conditions just ensure that you can solve the equation. But that doesn't mean that those terms here, for instance, that term doesn't disappear. That term is still there. Okay? And you need to take those into account, of course. Okay? So well, after all, all of that, yeah. So as you can see, well, there are many solvability conditions and those need to be imposed at each order, okay? Like in the general, in the general case, okay? And one extra condition we have is this condition over here. Where does that condition come from? Well, it comes from this equation over here, okay? That seems quite like weird probably, okay? Because it's sort of like, how general is that condition? I mean, I haven't yet proved that the condition is sort of like uh, general, but I think it should be, or maybe, I mean, maybe there are some conditions under which it is true, or maybe it is not, who knows? But the thing here is that this is interesting because that condition, together with the, all the other conditions that have to do with the parameters, allow you to split these terms into different, like, uh, different vectors being determined to for each, uh, each of the amplitudes, if each of those terms uh, that depend on the amplitude, okay? That doesn't happen at, at order five, so for that reason it's sort of like interesting to understand it for now, okay? We are gonna go into some details afterwards, so don't worry. Okay, so after you ensure that all those solvability conditions uh, hold and everything like can be done, all this expansion is valid, okay? You get at the fifth order uh, equation, you, you get something like this, which is quite terrible in many different senses. Why? Because these are all just a few terms, okay? And that those have to do only with the exponential to the ikx. Of course, there are more terms over here that, that have to do with, the, depend on the other amplitudes. And, uh, well, there are also the, the squares of those exponentials and the cubes and so on, okay? And that, apart from that, you need to consider the complex conjugate of that. I mean, the equations are quite terrible. Yeah, I know that. But what happens here? Here, actually, we don't want, I mean, we don't want to sort of like split all those terms because we could start like, I don't know, let us define A1 prime prime time, uh, times another vector and we get a solvability condition. And here we get like uh, the norm of A1 squared times A1 dash, and we get another solvability condition and so on. That will give you like plenty of solvability conditions and you probably won't be able to solve them all because you only have five parameters or four. And you have here like mm, seven uh, solvability conditions. That's quite impossible. So what can you do instead? Well, let us just combine all these terms together, okay? So in the end, as you, will ha as you have so, uh, an equation that looks like this, well, let us apply a solvability condition to the whole equation, okay? So what can we do? Well, we just apply the inner product with the vector psi here. And what will we, what we, will we get in the end? Something like this, which is just a scalar equation. That's pretty nice, isn't it? So, to solve this equation, well, there are like many different things you can like um, um, note here, but just sort of like um, for being simple, I will just say, okay, one sets A1 being equal to R e to the I phi. Okay, that's the thing. And then the equation becomes something like this. This is only one equation, but this can be split uh, into the real and imaginary parts. That's the thing, and you get two equations over here, okay? What's the nicest part of this? Well, the, se the second equation can be easily solved in this way, or kind of solved, that's just the form of psi. It, 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 I mean, it, does, it, it isn't giving the, the actual value of phi, but it's sort of like, it's giving you a, a, a nice expression for it, okay? And another nice thing is that if you have a look at uh, Chapman and Kosirov's paper, they have this term over here, but that term doesn't appear. In the general case, of course, you need to take care of all those terms, okay? So with this, the first equation becomes, of, because of course you can replace this into the first equation, the first equation becomes something like this. 
which is quite hellish, I know that, which is sort of like, oh, how can we solve that? Well, the good thing is that here we have uh, our, our double prime, and here we don't have any um, our, uh, our prime. So we can integrate this once, of course, mul multiplying the equation by, I, by r prime once. You can integrate it once then, and you get something like this, okay? Again, this looks quite hellish. This doesn't look that nice, okay? And it's kind of, well, in the end, those will be just uh, like ugly parameters, ugly parameters, ugly parameters, ugly parameters. In the end, you can just solve this equation in general. That's the thing. I mean, I, I like this kind of stuff because you can sort of like generalize everything like in, a, in, the, in the simplest way possible in some sense. Okay, so this is the form of the equation and that is the equation you will get in a general system. That's uh, the best part. I mean, if you know how to solve this equation, then you get everything. You have like literally everything, okay? Then we just say, okay, consider y being equal to this kind of stuff. This is just like, uh, I don't know, there are some like standard procedures to solve these kinds of equations, okay? And then you get this equation over here, okay? And after some algebra, you will may need to sort of like make some changes of variables and everything to integrate that equation. We can see that we have something over like, like that. That is the solution of that to that equation, okay? There is only one tiny little detail here that I should uh, make mention of, I think. This actually is to do with uh, some, some integral that looks like this. Say dx over the square root of, you remember, set to squared minus four, set one, set three. Okay, sorry, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, so. Can this be seen here? Okay, yeah. So uh, this term over here has to do with an integral that looks like this. The integral of dx over the square root of set two squared minus four set one set three plus set one x squared. Okay, remember here that all the sets are just coefficients, okay? So, of course, to integrate this, this equation in general, you need to sort of like uh, know something about the sign of this term and the sign of this. In this case, to get this uh, explicit expression of the solution, I just assume that these are positive. But of course, you can sort of like start splitting things and say, okay, if this is positive, if this is negative, if, if this is positive, if this is positive as well, or something like that, you will start getting different uh, hyperbolic functions. Okay, Those are, that, that is sort of like uh, a, a little assumption I am making in that step. Okay, just to sort of like make it simple. Okay. Then just remember that y is equal to one over the square root of p, okay? But that of course is a denominator. So you need to take care of the zeros of p, which are exactly the singularities of a1, which is to do exactly with what we have been seeing like from yesterday up to like the morning, okay? The singularities matter in the beyond order as asymptotic stuff, okay? So the zeros of p are given by all the all these terms, x being equal to x naught, where this is equal to zero. Remember, I am using the same uh, assumption here with the cosh, but of course that can be maybe a sedge or a tanch or whatever. Okay, so we can set like after you find all these um, singularities, okay, you can set an ansatz. This is the uh, a general ansatz as well. Okay. You can set just this ansatz, which is exactly the same ansatz we have seen quite a lot of times in the last few days, okay? With a and r being equal to something like this, times now this is a vector. This is not just a scalar, okay? And the nice thing, the best part of this is that the nonlinear terms will not matter in some sense, okay? For this part of the, the um, procedure, they, do, they won't matter. Okay, when n tends to infinity and epsilon tends to zero. So, well, you can set b and r, which is the vector we are trying to determine now, 
okay, being equal to some kappa to the power of n times another vector over there, okay? And in the end, you will get a system like this, which is quite nice because that's just like a, an eigenvalue problem essentially, okay? Where MKR is a matrix, sorry, that should be kappa, is a matrix with polynomial form in kappa, okay? In fact, this is the form of the matrix. I mean, I haven't done all the calculations yet, but that's like, I, I mean, from what I have seen and from what I calculated just quickly, that's the, that must be the form of the, the equation. Probably there are uh, some scal scalars over there. Who knows, okay? Then, of course, you have a matrix. You have here an equation that is equal to zero. This is a homogeneous equation. And of course, you don't want this vector to be the trivial vector. So of course, what you need to do? Well, you need to find the values of kappa such that this, the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero, okay? And as you can see, kappa is raised to the power of n, and as n is turning to infinity, only some of those values will matter, okay? Consider only those roots that have the largest amplitude in terms of r, okay? I mean, in the general case, of course, this can lead to like quite hellish um, equations, that's true. But the good thing is that this is quite general. This is quite uh, sort of like you can deal with many different examples and maybe see whether like there is some like um, there are particular cases under which this is like, I don't know, um, quite more terrible than other cases or something like that. Remember that, of course, this is a, a fourth degree polynomial and when you get the determinant that will give, um, that will be raised to the power of n, like the, the number of components of the system. So it's sort of like, I mean, this might be quite hellish, but it's a general stuff. So after that, you find the associated eigenvectors, I mean the vectors dr, that are part of the leading order solution. And that's the first part of everything. With that, you can make use of that here in this, uh, in this general term over here. And then the only thing that remains is the estimation of the remainder, okay? But I haven't done that yet. I mean, this is, uh, as I told you, this is like, I, I don't know, my progress in just one month. And it's sort of like, I think it's pretty interesting and I am still working uh, on this. This is not like yet uh, finished, okay? But the study of the remainder helps determine the value of n at which we tr truncate the asymptotic expansion, as most of you know. And this is needed to estimate the amplitude of the snaking, okay? That is my, like my, that's what I want to um, um, find out, okay? And of course, the last question is what? What happens with the prosolator? This is a, a general stuff, but this can be applied to that, well, or hopefully at least, okay? So as I told you, well, I have like a list of other projects I have been dealing with during my PhD. I mean, I'm not gonna deal, uh, talk about all of them, but uh, I have dealt in particular with general necessary and sufficient conditions for having a Turing or Turing Hoff instability pattern. And I have dealt with the criticality of the Turing bifurcations in a general way as well. I mean, I like to do all the things as general as possible. That's the thing. And of course, I am really open to any other projects. I mean, if you have any ideas or uh, you think that we can sort of work together at any point, just get in touch and we can just start working, okay? As in, in a general way or in a particular way, who knows? Okay, and those are uh, some references I used for this presentation, okay? Th uh, that's the reference from where I got the graph, a graph I showed you. And these are the papers that I, I talked about, the Chapman and Kosius paper, and uh, Dean and Matthew's paper, and Hannes David's paper. And that's it, I think that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I want to take the integrated, it took the integration constant to be uh, zero. Uh, yeah. Is there a reason for that? Uh, no, just for simplicity, I just chose that constant to be zero be because in the end, you're just looking for a solution. So it doesn't matter. I mean, with the constant, you can sort of like make it look nicer in some sense, but it doesn't like, it won't change the, like the, the main part of the analysis. Uh, I mean, you mean here in this part over here? Yeah, after you, if it is, then 
I mean, the only constant that appears here is this is plus c, or like inside of the. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I mean, I understand, but in the end, I think we're just looking for a solution. That's the thing. So I, I was just sort of like focusing on getting one solution. Mm -hmm. That's everything. Yeah, but of course, like maybe maybe that can sort of like I don't know make a change. Who knows? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a so this is the general solution you're saying, right? But yeah. Uh, but near the Maxwell point, you want p to go to well, p is you want y to go to zero at one end and to a constant at the other end, right? Yeah. But I don't see how to do that in by choosing the variables in your cosh. That's always yeah. Re to remember zero. that this this depends on the on these conditions over here. Depends on the sign of these terms. I mean, I just solved the the thing assuming that these terms are positive. But of course, this cosh can get a, like a, can change to a search or a tange or a many different um, hyperbolic functions, depending on the change of variables you need to do to um, solve that equation. In fact, here, as you can see, I'm just taking the square root of that, but I have no idea whether that's uh, real or not. Okay. Yeah. Then I mean, it is something that I, I can do, but it's it just for like for simplicity. I just try to explain. This is just one formula. Okay. All right. Any last question? Uh, no, okay, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah.